Okay, I shall start now. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all participants. Welcome and thank you for joining our webinar today titled Tourism Review Agenda 2030. Before we start, let me go through some housekeeping on the GoToWebinar system. On your control panel, there's an orange arrow that opens and closes your control panel. So you can see the whole screen and you can change the audio option. This is uh, mainly for the organizers and the panelists. All attendees microphones are muted just to ensure that the whole webinar is, um, you know, is um, going on well. And participants, you can use the questions tab okay to ask presenters during the presentation so you just type your question and then our panelists will pick up on it and then they will ask uh, during the question and answer session later on and this session will be recorded and will be shared with everyone else after the session and participants will receive attendance certificate and recording link 24 hours post session so uh, my name is Rosita G. I'm the Regional Marketing Manager for Emro Publishing and together with me is Elvin Chia, the Business Manager for Emro Publishing. So with us here also is Professor Dimitrios Bohalis, the Editor-in-Chief of Tourism Review and a few of his associate editors. So without further ado, I shall now pass the session to Prof Bohalis. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much, Rosita, and uh, welcome to everybody. It's a great uh, opportunity to actually get together and connect and have a conversation, uh, especially uh, what we call about Tourism 2030, and that's part of the virtual uh, special issue that we're developing for Tourism Review to address all the challenges that we are facing in the future. Now, if you had told me two, two and a half years ago that we'll still be dealing with COVID, I would have said no, by this time it would have been gone. But in Hong Kong currently, we're having a fifth wave and it's quite, quite dramatic. Um, so I'm on my hotel room, my hotel icon, and uh, I'm, 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 I'm working from my home studio effectively. Now, let me welcome everybody and uh, thank Emerald and Rosita and Elvin in particular who have uh, said the technical <laughs> things on the background and Garitan Wayne Khan, who is the facilitator of this. He, he is the man behind all the connections and he's, he's the, the main facilitator. And then CC Leng all the way in Texas, which is two <laughs> uh, o'clock in the morning or something. Uh, that she just got out of bed, uh, put her lipstick in, and she's ready to rock and roll, and then she's going to go back to sleep afterwards. So we may as well do it quickly. It's a great opportunity to actually talk about that. Let me invite and welcome my other colleagues who are associate editors in the Interim Review. Dr. Chen from San Yat-sen University, close to us. Uh, and I hope that the border is going to open so I can go and visit my good friend and collaborator, Simon Darcy in Sydney. Uh, my other good friend and excellent collaborator, Daisy Fan in Bond University with her new glasses, which we really like. Um, then we've got my good friend, Fei Fei in Southeast University in Nanjing. And we are waiting for Anna, Anna Farmaki in Cyprus University of Technology that is going to be joining us uh, later on. And hopefully Robin Nunko from Mauritius and Peter O'Connor from the University of South Australia who has just had to go back to Ireland. Um, they'll be hopefully joining us later on. Uh, but it's a good opportunity to actually start the webinar and have a conversation uh, with all of you. Uh, there is a question uh, button on that system, the, the go to webinar, and I've asked Gary to actually keep a, keep an eye on the questions. And, and what the way we're going to do it is that we are going to go through the different SDGs, the Strategic Development Goals for 2030. And then uh, I would like to actually take questions as we go along rather than keep you waiting for three hours and then 
have a conversation. So whenever you have a question, please uh, type it in and I'll ask Gary to bring the questions when he feels appropriate to the right to the right speaker so we can go with that. So welcome to the webinar. Um, I'll be your moderator and I'll be uh, giving you a little bit of trouble and my good colleagues, the associate editors, they'll be addressing different areas. So uh, most of you know about Tourism Review and uh, you know my kind of concentration on Agenda 2030 because uh, it's coming from the United Nations, but also we are moving fast towards towards 2030. 2030 will be seven, eight years down the line, and we're having so many challenges. And therefore, we, we decided to dedicate uh, a special, a virtual special issue to Agenda 2030. But if we get more papers, we'll, we'll publish more papers on 2030. I think the situation we've got currently post-COVID um, in for some places like Europe, but in Asia, we still see COVID going up again, so we are not out of that trouble yet. Plus the situation in Ukraine uh, and the war that is uh, uh, giving us a, a huge headache and we don't know where it's going to go, it's giving us challenges beyond belief. If you had told me some years ago that in 2022 we'll be talking about people killing other people, I would have said, no way, we have matured enough and we've moved forward to, to another kind of situation. But we find ourselves going backwards rather than forwards. And instead of uh, looking for humanity and solidarity, we're finding uh, uh, a very challenging kind of political, economic uh, situations that they are driving a whole range of, of challenges. And, and tourism has been even more challenged because of this. And that has got implications for many small businesses, many regions around the world that they are, that they are depending on tourism. Let's go to the next slide, uh, Gary. So uh, the uh, tourism review is the most established. We don't, show, we, don't show, we don't normally say the oldest because uh, it's kind of an old lady, but it's not. It's very vibrant, it's very, uh, enthusiastic and moving forward very, uh, very quickly. Uh, it's the most established journal in tourism, started in 1946, just after the Second World War. So we are very much uh, in line with all the challenges. The journal started by those very clever and, and inspirational people that they, they saw tourism as a way to get out of the war, the Second World War, and bring forward uh, solutions to, to, to regions. So in fact, uh, 77 years later, we are still dealing with the same mission in, in doing good uh, to, to society globally. Uh, the impact factor has gone to almost six in 2020. I eagerly wait for the impact factor of 2021, and hopefully there'll be a, a very nice surprise you can see what has happened in side score from 4.5 in 2020 went to 7.9 in 2021, uh, just below eight. And I'm just waiting for that to go over eight, if, if, if you're asking me. So we are a generic journal, so we are in very privileged in, in the sense that we can accept papers that they're dealing with a whole range of different areas of tourism, and they are dealing with a lot of different uh, uh, methodologies. So we very much like to encourage you to submit your work in Tourism Review. We also want you to read the Tourism Review to, to, to prescribe that to your students and to make sure that you are using it on your own research. Next slide. This must be the video. OK, so you have got a video from Emerald in uh, uh, the, the, the headquarters uh, and uh, they like to say how uh, Emerald is looking after the United Nations uh, strategic development goals. So that will be uh, a video for about one minute, one minute and 40 seconds. At Emerald Publishing, we aim to champion researchers, practitioners, policy makers and organisations who share our goals of contributing to a more ethical, responsible and sustainable way of working. 
working together with institutions that recognise that governments should be just, lawful and built on ethical and sustainable practices. Those that lead with integrity and are underpinned by robust management systems. That are educating future leaders across all industries. We will work with them to facilitate the real impact of what they do. And by aligning our content to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we can help researchers deliver real societal change. If this goal matches your institution's vision and you're passionate about decent work for all that doesn't discriminate or cause harm to economies, communities or resources, please get in touch. We're here to support you by ensuring your work reaches a wide audience and influences real change. We invite authors who share the same goal to get in touch by visiting our Responsible Management Information Hub. As well as using the page to get in touch, you can also find out about other research in this area, discover publishing options and access support tools, blogs and news. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. This was our publisher Hazel from uh, London uh, sending her regards and, and the strategy of Emerald. So you've seen what's the background of what we're trying to achieve. Uh, it's how tourism is in the center of the strategic development goals and it's really looking to how tourism is addressing its strategic development goal. I know that the United Nations who work tourism organization has identified three or four of them, but I think um, I think tourism uh, is 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 uh, addressing all the strategic development goals. And you'll see the call for papers that we've got in different places, and you see that basically we are looking to visionary uh, uh, papers that they are looking to how uh, tourism is addressing the strategic development goals. Already, we had several papers that they are currently in review, but we are very, very keen to receive more papers and to get the best research in this area. Thank you, Gary. The next one. So the main question that we've asked our associate editors to look at is how can the tourism industry and the tourism activity in general can help achieve the strategic development goals from the United Nations World Tourism Organization with an agenda 2030. Now, given the challenges that we have and given COVID and given the war and given the, the various things that are, are happening as a result of that in, uh, in the increased prices of material, of food, of energy, of gas, um, I think that there'll, there'll be a delay to achieve a lot of those things by 2030. But we really need to have the, the direction of travel and we need to make sure that we are supporting everything in order to achieve those. Let's go to the next one. So now um, our colleagues are going to address different strategic development goals and they'll talk to different slides. And the first colleague is Dr. Chen from San Yen-sen University in China. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today, uh, it is my pleasure to share with you some of my thoughts on the SDGs. Uh, specifically, I'm going to touch on uh, two of them. The first one is uh, good health and well-being. Uh, actually, as you may know, that uh, much attention has been given to uh, frontline uh, employees and tourists' mental health problems and their well-being issues. But actually, we have largely uh, ignored a very big group of people in our industry, uh, the, the entrepreneurs, the funders, the CEOs in the travel, tourism, and hospitality industry. Uh, they needed to be uh, focused because they are making uh, decisions and uh, they are in charge of the tourism business. So actually, the mental health problems of tourism and uh, entrepreneurs have not yet received enough attention. Uh, in the general uh, entrepreneurship literature, actually research has shown 
uh, mental health problems has become a very serious problem for uh, entrepreneurs globally. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, there is a research that shows almost half of entrepreneurs have suffered from at least one mental health problem at some point in their lives. Actually, uh, if you are troubled, uh, if you are a high, uh, high manager, if you uh, are a decision maker, I'm not just a ordinary uh, tourism practitioner, practitioner uh, uh, you are very critical to the sustainable development of the tourism business and to the uh, industry. So uh, actually there is a research uh, which is not published yet uh, uh, and it, it shows that the mental di distress of tourism entrepreneurs uh, during a crisis, for example the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, still have a very huge impact on their business sustainability. Uh, this paper is not uh, published yet, but uh, I would like to uh, recommend that we need to uh, pay uh, more attention to the following uh, aspects. Uh, as I have said that we have paid enough attention, I mean, uh, we have paid uh, much attention to the well-being, to the mental health problems of tourists and to those uh, ordinary employees, but now we needed to pay more attention to uh, another group of uh, very important person. Uh, the, the first one is that uh, we needed to pay more attention to uh, those small and medium-sized uh, tourism prices, uh, tourism uh, business, because uh, most, the majority of uh, tourism business is uh, small and medium, medium-sized uh, business. And uh, the second aspect is that the, the gender differences uh, in mental health of entrepreneurs uh, sh uh, should be fully explored. Uh, there are uh, a growing number of studies that looks into the uh, gender differences in entrepreneurship, but uh, we still need more research uh, into the relationship between mental health and uh, tourism business sustainabilities and other uh, business behaviors. So, okay, so the next slide. Thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about before, the SDG six. Before you go uh, to to the next slide, let's let's go back. Let's talk one SDG at the time. Just give okay. me one minute. Have we got any any questions, uh, Gary? So far, uh, Prof, no questions. Okay, that's great. So there are a lot of issues here, like Dr. Chen mentioned, and also we've got aging, we've got a whole range of, of health and also mental health as well. And if there is something that we've learned in the last two years is how important tourism is to mental health. And I think yeah. that, should be, so that should be reflected. And also, you know, I don't want to concentrate on the 2030 too much on COVID, but but what we have learned from COVID will be very very interesting uh, in in the future. Thank you, thank you. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, let's move on. Uh, uh, next, I'm going to talk about the uh, SDG six, clean water and sanitation. Uh, according to my personal uh, understanding, uh, actually the tourism and the hospitality industry is a very large water consumer and also in many parts of the world and in many aspects uh, the industry is actually a big polluter. So uh, the the relationship between clean water and tourism development is very complicated. So I would like to suggest that we need to pay uh, more attention to the interplays uh, between cleaning water and the sanitation and the tourism development, uh, especially in uh, developing regions. Uh, and uh, specifically, I would like to uh, recommend uh, the following four uh, future research directions. The first one is who has the priority, especially in those developing regions, the, uh, who, who has been given the priority to use, to have access to uh, the clean water, uh, the locals or the tourists. There has been a, a growing uh, tensions between these two groups of people. Uh, the second one is how can tourism uh, development projects improve the availability of clean water, uh, especially in heritage regions and in 
uh, arid areas. So this is a very big issue for uh, for people uh, who are currently living in in a place that has been designated as a, a World Heritage Site. Uh, for example, in those ter uh, uh, there is uh, many uh, cases in uh, in the uh, Asian context. Uh, the third one I would like to address is the governance issues uh, uh, with with regard to clean water and uh, sanitation in tourism development, uh, especially the stakeholder uh, relationships, the institutional uh, changes, the politics, and exaggerate. The last one is that from a behavior uh, perspective, I mean, a lot of study uh, have examined the uh, environmental behaviors of tourists with uh, regard to water saving, but most of them are actually uh, are focused on intentions, but we know uh, intentions so sometimes is just uh, intentions. So uh, maybe in the future we should pay more attention to uh, actual behaviors, uh, uh, mostly based on experiment studies. Uh, we really need to uh, encourage uh, how uh, tourist uh, environmental behaviors can be realized, uh, the their actual behaviors. Uh, so. Uh, th that's all about this slide. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen. Have you got any questions, Gary? So far, no questions. Oh, uh, sorry, I, I think we might have a question. Um, just for one. Um, so, Why from I Pinto. Uh, okay. I, I just question. want to say that clean water is a huge issue, especially on islands. Uh, mm -hmm. And especially in, in regions where they don't have supply of, of clean water and sanitation. So islands are, are very much in, um, in favor in developing tourism, but quite often clean water and sanitation is a huge challenge for them because they don't yes. have access to clean water. And I think yes. that is a, a big thing to look at places like Bali or the Greek islands, or some of the Canary Islands, they need to import water from different places. You have yes. a question, Gary? Yes, we have. Uh, okay, the first question, China has experienced a huge increase in domestic tourism uh, in the past two years. Given we still have mental distress growing among Chinese citizens, is the well-being aspect more relevant to outbound than it's to domestic? Uh, could you please repeat the question? Okay. So, uh, yeah, China has experienced a huge increase in domestic tourism in the past two years. Given mm -hmm. we still have mental distress growing among Chinese citizens, is the well-being aspect more relevant to outbound than it is to domestic? Uh... I mean the mental health problems in in domestic yeah, tourists in distress. China. Mm. Uh, actually, uh, yes. If uh during the lockdowns, I mean a lot of people they cannot go out, so uh, so so they cannot visit uh out of bound destinations, so they have to travel uh within the country, right? Uh, I think this is also a very uh a very important way to uh relieve themselves i mean if you are, are are kept home i mean your mental health will be uh, a, a very big uh, problem but so far so good i mean yeah at least we can um, travel no. uh domestically yeah this is a global problem we found that everywhere a lot of people had to stay domestic and actually they explore their backyard which is also very good because most of tourism around the world is domestic. It's actually not international. But, and but of another, course, they will miss. Yes. And another important point is that China is so big, right? So if you travel uh, from Guangdong to Xinjiang province, I mean, it takes it takes it takes you five hours of air flight. So it's big enough to, for you to travel to to explore, to relax yourself, to help you restore yourself. So. So I don't think this is a very big problem for Chinese citizens because they have such a vast country. Yeah. If you're in Luxembourg, it takes five minutes. 
Let's, uh, being a very small country. Okay, let's go to the next uh, SDG. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. We have Fei Fei. Have we got Fei Fei on the call? Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Fei Fei. All right. Um, okay. Hello. Um, my name is Fei Fei, and I'm uh, speaking from Nanjing, um, from Southeast University here. Um, I would like to talk about the SDG Go 12. Uh, as we all know that the United Nations Environmental Programme talked about um, the Go 12. It states as to ensure sustainable consumption and production practices necessarily entails to respect the biophysical boundaries of the planet and to reduce current global consumption rates in order to fit with the biophysical capacity to produce ecosystem services and benefits. Essentially, I think this just makes us to think about this the balance between development and sustainable. Right. So uh, the way I see it, uh, I think we need to consider two things in particular. One, I think we need to consider the consumption within the capacity of nature environment. Um, obviously, uh, we see in a lot of countries, we have seen a shift from anthropocentrism to ecocentrism. Well, anthropocentrism is where people think there are they are the dominant of the world, um, while the ecocentrism thinks that um, we should not, human beings should not be the center of the world, but we should treat animals, we should treat the ecosystems, flowers and trees, we should treat them equally. Therefore, we see a uh, there is already a shift from the anthropocentrism to ecocentrism, which will lead to green consumption. We have seen a lot of examples. There is support for um, buying organic food. You know, uh, there are also other many other ways uh, to support green consumption. I think this also means we need to have a more domestic view on nature, wildlife and human beings, because we are all on one planet. Um, talking about the COVID-19 global pandemic, which has drast uh, drastically shifted the landscape of sustainable consumption. You know, I think the anticipated future impacts are not well known, particularly the long-term impacts. And, but we can see in the tourism field, we can see some trends such as people, uh, pref people prefer to go to short distance, People prefer shorter holidays, uh, domestic tourism, as just mentioned, and also staycation. Instead of moving around, uh, people will just stay in one particular place for uh, uh, rather than moving place from place to place. You know, I think this all means less carbon footprint. We also see trends like people go to uh, rural destinations. Rural destination prefer to go outdoor activities uh, that appreciate more about nature. Um, I think in last year's special issue of Frontiers in Sustainability, there's one particular paper, and um, this paper proposed a paradise scenario of sustainable consumption as a low pressure on the nature environment, which we can understand, and high productivity, this is what we want. And they also pro, uh, propose a third, um, a third dimension of happiness. Um, just now I mentioned, um, I heard that people talked about the questions about well-being, happiness. So in this particular paper, they mentioned a third dimension of how we uh, measure sustainable consumption instead of traditionally um, care about environment and think about uh, productivity, but we also adding this new dimension of psychological elements like happiness. I think this is a new dimension. Um, this is particularly talked um, after 
or or we say the post the COVID-19 um, um, uh, post the COVID-19 um, er. Will this be reflected in travel and the tourism? I think this is something we can think about or talk about, definitely. Another thing I think which is important in talking about um, the SDG 12 um, is the consumption with the principle of equality between and within generations. I think this is also important particularly um, we think about ethical issues in tourism. Uh, we see in the pandemic, uh, we see the differences in a lot of uh, different countries. In some countries, people can quickly get in a uh, vaccine, but in other countries, particularly um, develop, developing countries, people cannot be um, getting the vaccine very quickly. And we talked about a social um, justice, um, in tourism, we have fair trade tourism. Um, also, I think will this be emphasized particularly in the post COVID world? And I think another question we need to think about is the sustainable lifestyle and the travel behavior. We all know that during the COVID-19 situation, um, Everything is slowed down. <laughs> uh, we join, we enjoy and spend time with our families um, due to this slowed down, particularly. And in a paper talk about um, consumption, uh, Professor Sharpley talked about moderate consumption. This slowed down um, the spending less, um, spending less patterns that makes us to think about our consumption. Uh, some of the consumption, uh, is it necessary? Do we really need those consumption? Therefore, the term moderate consumption. I think this is something we need to think about as well after the COVID-19 uh, situation. And I think also we need to think about a sustainable use of tourism resources. Um, a lot of people th say that technology can help. Um, yes, uh, we probably we think about we are using a much cleaner uh, engine. We are using um, biofuel. Uh, we are um, thinking about um, using technology to help us. Yes, technology can help to deal with the environmental issues, um, but policy matters. I think in Sharpley's research about young people, um, they find that only cost and policy will make the young people fly less. So in this paper, policy is the most important thing. And he called that a good dictatorship uh, matters. But I think fundamentally, perhaps it's more the environmental ethics that we need to think about. It's basically the way how we um, treat nature. It's the way how we deal with nature and it's environmental ethics that actually determines how we use nature resources. I think all of these will need to be discussed uh, in detail, or we need to think about if you want to respond to uh, SDG 12. That's my idea. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fei Fei. Um, it's, it's, I've been answering uh, several questions, but I think Fei Fei has indicated a, a whole range of different issues that are on sustainability and responsible consumption. Do you have any specific questions, Gary? Um, not at the moment, no questions. Okay, let's go to the next one and then we'll, we'll see how we can come back. Daisy. Okay, hey, so um, thanks for the opportunity. So I would like to talk about several of the SDG uh, goals um, just to open the discussion later on. And the first one is about the goal 11. So sustainable cities and communities. And for this topic, I feel um, there's already quite a few studies in our tourism academy. So talking about different issues there. So I try to summarize some of the themes which I feel 
uh, most relevant in this topic and also to generate some thoughts you know, uh, for this uh, special issue. For example, the technology, I think for different goals, we talked about the technology, the role of technologies, and I feel it is uh, particularly important uh, to address this kind of goal, especially to uh, address how to enable destinations to enhance their level of resilience and also their sustainability levels. Uh, especially we talk about the smart tourism, smart destinations quite a lot. And I believe my colleagues later on will also discuss on this point. So um, yes, the role of technology is very important to keep these communities more re resilient. And when we talk about the, you know, the definitions of this goal, uh, the UN gave some uh, explanation about making the cities and human settlements more inclusive, safe, resilience and sustainable. So that also gave us some of the insights where we can start with. And talk about the destinations themselves. I feel uh, rethinking about the destination resources is also uh, you know, options for us to restart tourism or make it more sustainable. For example, uh, besides those uh, existing well-developed destination resources like heritage, or nature-based resources, oceans, uh, mountains. Um, shall we think about some other or alternative destination resources, which are more intangible, but also very attractive? For example, uh, those culture tourism, gastronomy tourism, uh, or intangible uh, like a, a cultural heritage. So we could take this chance to think about that and how we could consolidate our resources locally. And I believe there's a lot of uh, joint calls in Europe addressing those kind of intangible cultural heritage nowadays. So get, this gave us a chance to uh, think about this option. Um, another theme I would like to raise is about the social sensibility in tourism. Um, so basically, if we are thinking about this term from two points, firstly, regarding the resident side. So how can the residents benefit better from the tourism development. And now for some of the regions, for example, rural tourism development is quite popular, but can we ensure that the local residents in different villages or rural areas, they could benefit you know, the most or maximize their benefit from tourism development, rather than we just relocate them, uh, moving them out of the village and making their social and cultural elements disappeared. So that is not benefiting this village at all. And uh, yeah, those kind of uh, development, well, that keep the essence of the rurality. So that's also some of the agenda we should think about in the development. If we're thinking about the uh, tourism side, so we know there's a lot of reports accusing those uh, tourists, um, you know, their misbehavior, deviant behaviors in destinations, but of course, most of them are before the pandemic. So think about those kind of tourism behaviors, how those kind of behaviors could influence destinations stability. So it's like a response uh, be, uh, from, from those communities, how they are responding to those, uh, uh, for example, misbehavior or poor social behavior or poor environmental behavior from tourists. So that's also some of the uh, thoughts. And the last point, um, I think social tourism is also very relevant to these uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, thinking about different peoples in destinations or in our communities, especially for those disadvantages or marginal groups, are they having the equal opportunities to attend those different tourism activities? For example, age, like senior people, do we have enough or sufficient facilities or even access to information? for those people to attend different activities, or for the kids, children in uh, low income families, can they have you know, some opportunities to explore the world by tourism? That I feel also uh, you know, belongs to these uh, goals, I think. Dimitris, any questions? Thank you very much, Daisy. There's a question uh, from someone called Pinto at the University of Macau that he talks about the pandemic has created a pent up demand for, tu for tourism and small businesses have endured through financial hardship in the last two years. 
So that reminds me that sustainability is not only about the environment, but the whole range of things that include the economic sustainability, the communities and how they're, 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 they're developing. Uh, how do you think we should be addressing small businesses and what has happened to them in terms of being resilient and being sustainable in their communities? Okay, so I think this uh, is a very good point. Starting from another angle of this, uh, you know, this uh, stakeholders' point of view. Um, yes, I feel especially for tourism, hospitality is uh, among the most hit industry uh, through this pandemic. And uh, among them, I think small to medium-sized entrepreneurship is, uh, is uh, the worst, you know, uh, damage uh, from this uh, this kind of uh, um, disaster. Um, yes, there's a lot of uh, other companies bankrupt, they shut down because of this uh, huge gap of lack of business. And even though some of the countries, they provide some of the, you know, uh, helping or supporting schemes, for example, uh, uh, furloughed or I think in, in the UK, right? And some other countries as well, reducting of the, the tax or something like this. But still, I think they probably need some more support or they can join together, form some partnership, uh, among different small uh, to medium entrepreneurships to fight against the future potential disaster incidents. I think it's not only about climate, it's not only about pandemic, but maybe climate or food, um, like some incidents, there's a lot of different kind of, uh, you know, um, interruptive you know, uh, accidents or incidents may happen in this industry. So they have to think about this system to support each other. Yes. Absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, we all can kind of do our little thing to help the situation. And I'll tell you what's happening here in Hong Kong, because all the restaurants are closing at six o'clock, so you cannot go to smaller restaurants anymore. And a lot of businesses have found, especially in the last two or three weeks, really uh, difficult to operate because they are not making any money. They were spending more money to operate than not to operate. So I'll tell you my little approach to it is, is to go out and get food from the small businesses rather than the big the big um, chains. And the other thing is to not use Deliveroo or Food Panda or any of the applications because these applications they charge 25, 30 percent of 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 the ticket uh, for the distribution. So um, in order to support the small businesses, you know, we can all do little things and also the small businesses will learn how to operate in terms of resilience and what they have got to do to, to manage uh, the situation in a better way. But, but I, think, I think it's really important to actually look into tourism and hospitality in this case on, on how we can uh, sustain cities and communities. And if I, 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 if I also like to uh, pay tribute to some of the restaurants and some of the places around the world that during all this crisis, despite being affected, they were producing food for communities that they needed it. They're delivering to hospitals. They're delivering in a lot of places. There's one restaurant, um, Indian restaurant, I think, in uh, in London called Panas that has has donated 100,000 meals to people that they needed that. And this is the level of solidarity that is actually sustaining cities and communities by bringing everybody together and bring the the social structures together. And 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 I think that is something we really want to see some solidarity so solidarity papers and to see how communities can get together at the time of crisis and how they can build resilience in, in cities and communities. Okay, I think Thank just you. to add, add to the point, uh, I think for if you're comparing the uh, SMEs uh, with those uh, big hotel chains or like international groups, I think they also have some bright side in facing those kind of you know, uh, uncertainties. For example, they're more flexible they don't really need to pay, you know, some certain fees or some uh, particular huge amount of uh, employees during different, you know, a, a, a period. So I think this is the bright side of those uh, SMEs. So I think one of the students uh, with uh, Dimitris and May, um, I think he's doing some research about 
how to uh, um, those tour guides during this pandemic, how they are using their capacities uh, and with the uh, support from a uh, sharing economy platforms. So building up their self-efficacy, how to uh, manage different kinds of capacities um, to try to uh, lose less at the beginning and how to negotiate with the customers. And it turned out to be, um, especially during the pandemic, the tour guide, especially on the shared economy, they are getting more business since uh, they are more flexible. They have more private services. So that is more favored during the pandemic. So there's still some hope, but uh, we need to be you know, um, together to think about solutions. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to the next uh, SDG. Um, I'm answering to a lot of you on uh, the on the questions at the same time, so we can save a little bit of time uh, and 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 cover everything. So Daisy, you're taking the next one as well, right? Energy. Yes, it's me again. <laughs> uh, even though I'm not the uh, expert in um, energy and also the next one, uh, life and the water, but um, I just want to open the discussion, give a little bit of intro, uh, introduction, and I also I noticed uh, I think Professor Robin. Nabuku has already joined that. So if any points you want to add in, please jump in, okay? Um, so for uh, goal number seven, affordable and clean energy. Um, so it's all about to ensure we have the access to affordable, reliable and sustainable and modern energy for all. So this is more uh, a very general term and it's actually applied to tourism quite well. Uh, but unfortunately, I think we don't really so far um, receive a lot of submissions or research piece of work regarding uh, for energy or for the life and the water, those kind of topics. Um, but later on, I will talk about maybe the, what's the constraints. Um, so first we would think about what's those uh, new or renewable energies compared with the traditional kind of energy we're consuming. For example, from a uh, 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 solar, wind, uh, hydro, uh, geothermal, or different biomasses. So there's a lot of other alternative resources um, that we could consider, especially for the small to medium-sized entrepreneurship, which they uh, do not really consume that huge amount of the energy, but they can think about other solutions to, uh, on one hand, save the, you know, the environment, but also to uh, reduce some of their cost. Okay. So that is uh, one of the, the, the direction. Um, but however, I think that the point is how well have those hotels or attractions adopted to those uh, new energies? Any barriers or constraints they're facing uh, maybe because of the economics, high expenses to replace everything in place, or um, was their understanding or psychological uh, adaptation to these new things? That uh, can be one direction. And also, how can we link the new energies adaptation with our customers' satisfaction and also the business performance? Since uh, um, at the end of the day, the, tour, um, the business want to earn some money. So if the cust uh, customers really agree with the uh, you know, green energy or renewable energy, uh, they feel this is part of their you know, uh, value, personal value. So that could also push the adaptation of this process. Um, but also the governments or organizations also need to play their roles in pushing or uh, promoting the, the adaptation of these uh, new energies. And another angle is about uh, so many people like self-driving trips, um, how well they're uh, adapting these uh, electric cars. I think there are more and more uh, people using electric cars uh, in at least in UK, I noticed. So uh, how about the other parts of the world? So what motivates them to use that? We can also do some research to, to find it out. And the next thing um, with those energies, how can we uh, have a higher uh, efficiency and the lower pollutions? And I think that also linked back to uh, Dr. Chen's uh, uh, topic, uh, less pollution. Since some of the energy, maybe they're producing more pollution and maybe the new energies, they have, can help up save the environment. And the one example is about the uh, cruise ship or cruise travel, which heavily relies on the energies and that stays in support every single activities on board. So how can we 
uh, try to address this issue, make it more sustainable, including uh, introducing new energies and also new technologies uh, that is also part of the um, our agenda. And also, what I think is uh, let's maybe research in tourism, uh, solely addressing the clean energy, since this is uh, highly uh, interdisciplinary. As a tourism scholars by ourselves, it might be impossible for us to you know, to tackle this kind of problem. But the solution is we have to go for the interdisciplinary you know, collaboration, work with scholars in other fields, for example, energy uh, design or like material. So we need to jointly develop some solutions to tackle this, this goal. That's what I believe, yeah. Thank you very much, Daisy. And, and I think a lot of, um... Uh, issues will be merging now because energy is the key area that we are challenged with with uh, the war in in Ukraine and with Russia and and I think that's mm -hmm. the biggest challenge that we are facing right now and and we need to look at that equally what what also the situation uh, for this year is that everybody has seen their energy bills going very high. And I think a lot of a lot of tourism and hospitality organizations will find it very challenging to operate. Um, the airlines will probably have to increase the price ticket because uh, of the fuel prices. So we'll have a whole range of issues that they're emerging with this. Uh, and this becomes a, a super important um, SDG. And especially since in tourism we are using quite a lot of energy either for air conditioning and cooling places down or to bring different products to different places and equally for heating uh, because a lot of people are going to extreme situations either very hot climates or very cold climates and we are consuming quite a lot of energy so i think that we'd like to see some research on this and would like to receive papers that they are addressing that Thank you very much. Let's go to the next slide. The, the last point from me. Okay. <laughs> so it's uh, life below water. Um, I think it's, uh, it's quite relevant for uh, several other goals, actually. For example, those are clean water and uh, how to treat those uh, development to benefit different uh, residents. Uh, it's very relevant. So um, it is about to conserve and uh, sustainably use the resources from ocean, seas, marines, so for our sustainable development. And what I can think of regarding the tourism aspect is uh, firstly, the most important thing, uh, the impact of our tourism activities on the ocean wildlife. Um, regarding uh, things like the harm we brought to the so wildlife, uh, also their habitats and the loss of the uh, biodiversity. So um, a lot of destinations, especially like islands, they rely heavily on those uh, wildlife and some of them, that's even their main attraction. So people go there and have some different close interaction with those uh, wildlife and also like uh, uh, diving, uh, snorkeling, or even you know visiting those uh, landscape under the sea. So those kind of activities, they all have the potential to uh, damage or to interrupt their normal uh, you know ecosystem for the wildlife. And uh, that's you know why we should be really uh, cautious about designing our tourism activities, how to provide a good experience. Uh, meanwhile, we need to give the the freedom or the privacy for the wildlife uh, for those uh, kind of destinations. And also that leads to the question, you know, uh, whether or not tourism and wildlife could coexist. Okay, um, that's a still question mark. It depends on how we're, we're producing it, how to, we're processing it. Another, uh, I think, theme is again, pollutions. Um, our activities, especially re uh, regarding the coastal tourism, island tourism and the cruise travel, um, we are producing a lot of pollutions to the ocean. And that could uh, heavily influence the, the quality of life for the wildlife and also the quality of the ocean. So that is also something we need to uh, pay attention to. 
um, it's glad to see some of the regions uh, or countries, they are getting together um, to build up some alliance to jointly tackle some of the very uh, urgent issues they're facing all together. For example, the SIDS, um, since they are facing some very similar issues about the environment, and some of them really, is, the damage should be permanent. So I think that's really a, a very important thing, how people join together. Uh, I think also building up partnership, no matter from the private, the private or public sector, or from the business to organization uh, aspect, people should get together um, to jointly develop some of the solutions or uh, procedures to develop islands tourism. Um, another point I feel uh, compared with the uh, land-based tourism, we tend to have a less research on those, you know, our attitudes or behaviors regarding those uh, uh, ocean-based or ocean-based tourism. So, for example, we have a lot of uh, measurements or studies tackling on um, tourist environmental friendly behavior, responsible behavior, or poor environmental behavior, but not many of them addressing the you know, ocean-related or uh, those coastal-related uh, tourism activities. So I believe that may be a very different skills of measurement or behavior uh, set of rules. So that's also some of my thoughts here. Thank you very much, uh, Daisy. Any Issues, any questions, colleagues? Simon, do you like to talk about life below water? I'm no, that's fine. You're you're fine. Okay, there's a there's a huge range of challenges that that we are facing there, and I think and and again, I'm answering to a lot of uh, the questions that are happening on the on the on the on the chat uh, and the questions, and a lot of people are asking um, a lot of questions, and they're asking. Uh, for us to provide the questions, and I, I keep repeating, uh, please do the research, write the paper, and submit it to Tourism Review, uh, because uh, we don't have all the answers, and especially we wouldn't give any answers unless we had the opportunity to actually study something in detail. And also they're asking, um, can we extend the deadline? I'll extend the deadline to middle of May, so I will take papers for 2030 until middle of the uh, middle of May so we'll be able to um, review them uh, in time for the special issue hopefully we'll do the first issue of 2023 uh, 20, uh, will be the special issue but we may have delay so um, please take take ideas please submit papers do the research and submit papers and so us how Tourism Review can support the tourism industry and the tourism um, governance and also the tourists to address those challenges as they are outlined us on SDG. Let's go to the next one, Gary. So, Simon, on decent work and economic growth. Yeah, yes, Demetrius, that's why you saw me have some movement. I thought I was up next, but I would like to make a segue in uh, coming off uh, the uh, issues to do with um, island tourism. Um, we've got a tradition in Australia where we uh, acknowledge the country of the First Nations people on uh, whose land I uh, give this presentation from today. Uh, in my case, the uh, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who are very much the traditional owners of the area of the areas that most of you would see as uh, the main tourist areas of Sydney, um, including uh, uh, the Benelong, one of the first uh, uh, leaders of the indigenous community uh, with colonization. Um, and there are some significant issues with First Nations people all around the world. Um, and they are also some people that are um, really uh, struggling with uh, climate and climate action, which will be my uh, my next issue. But it also links in with um, uh, decent work and economic growth. There's been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of tourism that has uh, been based on First Nations people, but not a lot of the wealth shared with First Nations people. Uh, and that segues into um, decent work and economic growth. I I'm going to, 
offers that a little a uh, little critical edge to it as well, and I'm keeping an eye on the time. In drawing on the ILO, ILO uh, International Labour Organization definition of decent work, it sums up the aspirations of people uh, in their work lives. Have we lost the sound? Daisy, can you hear fine? How's that? Yeah, that's better, Sam. Thank you. Okay. That's fine. Uh, better prospects for personal development and social integration, freedom for people to express their concerns, organize and participate in the decisions that affect their lives, and the equality of opportunity and treatment for all men and women, as it's stated in the ILO, and I would say all the intersections uh, involving First Nation, people with disability, migrants, refugees, etc. That do make up uh, some aspects of the tourism industry employees. So, if we go to the WTCC report of December 21 on staff shortages, we know there are some significant shortages while people may be wanting to return to travel after COVID, that either domestically or internationally, we're seeing these significant challenges. Um, and it's also a result of the precarious nature of some aspects of tourism work. Uh, and that's shared unevenly between the rich and the poor. So it was said in 2019 that tourism accounted for one in 10 jobs. Well, some 62 million of those travel uh, jobs were lost. That's an extraordinary number. Uh, and uh, even so, they still attribute about 272 million in that report by the WTTC. So while they go on, uh, while the WTO go on to say that travel and tourism has the potential to lead economic and employment revival, um, but recovery of the sector is currently hampered by staff shortages and also uh, a lot of that is in developed nations, uh, very little thought given to the developing nations. So what are some of the recommendations that they are looking at? Well, labour mobility, so they want to see a facilitation of talent mobility within and across borders, and also to remove travel uh, restrictions and the consideration of migration and visa policies. While we've seen the increase in hybrid work, it's certainly not um, it's certainly not uh, a, a possibility for anyone in customer-facing service roles. So we see that there's again an uneven distribution of hybrid work in tourism to the management classes who often are overrepresented by develop, uh, developed world people uh, having those senior higher paid jobs in the developing world. We also see uh, that if they're really gonna be serious, it's about training, reskilling and upskilling to retain workforce. Because what we're seeing now is people saying, I've been out of work, out of my hospitality position now for up to two years, or it's been very precarious in that time. I need more certainty. So how does the industry bring a certainty to their workforce? So training, education and working conditions to encourage entry into the tourism industry. Uh, the travel and tourism sector, uh, again from the WTTC report, uh, identifies they've got a unique opportunity to rethink and refresh prevailing business models in partnerships with local communities and in consideration with its most valuable asset, the environment on which it's based, which I'll go on to next. I want to finish on this uh, SDG uh, and I want to go to, um, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I want to finish on this uh, um, SDG by going back to the ILO that identifies the job security to combat informal jobs that tend to dominate the tourism industry, particularly in developing nations. Uh, and so there's some tremendous research opportunities around that work. I would also suggest that there are opportunities to develop the potential of marginalized groups who have much higher levels of unemployment, and that includes people with disability, migrants and refugees, if the industry is willing to invest in their development in a real way. So I'll stop there on decent work and economic growth.
Thank you very much, Simon. I think this is one of the biggest issues currently, uh, because what we've seen is that when we are coming back from COVID in those uh, economies that they are opening, they find really, really difficult to uh, recruit people to work in, in industry, and especially on the lower levels of skill, they, they, it's really, really uh, difficult to, to do that. So kitchen workers, not chefs necessarily, but kitchen workers, housekeepers, uh, people in the lower ranking and lower paid jobs, they find, most of the organizations around the world they find it really, really difficult to, to actually recruit. And I understand that many places in Australia and in England and in many different places underutilize their assets. They cannot operate in full capacity because they cannot find the staff to operate the, the full capacity. And part of that, Demetrius, is because um, hospitality work has never been seen as a career in, in Australia. Uh, New Zealand's got a different uh, approach. But certainly in Australia, it's uh, our fantastic overseas students that really prop up the industry um, together with um, others that uh, come in from the South Pacific. Yeah, and I think I think we really need to look into decent work and how uh, um, we operate uh, our human resources and how we are supporting talent in the future. I think that's one of the most critical elements. So far, I've managed to answer all the questions we had on the on the chat, so we can we can save a little bit of time. So let's go to the next SDG. It's me again. Um, I must have upset Demetrius because I I think he's given me um, the SDG where we could devote a whole webinar and really not even scratch the surface. So it's a tourism paradox. Tourism produces about 8% of overall CO2 emissions, and uh, it was estimated to be on a 4% growth per annum by Lens in 2018. So while tourism has the, uh, if we go back to the WTTC, tourism, they say, has the potential to create beneficial effects on the environment by contributing to environmental protection and conservation, by raising awareness of environmental values uh, it is possible to finance protection in natural areas and increase their economic significance. Uh, they go on to say that they can create and sustain shared value over the long term by acting to protect people and environment, fulfilling the SDG as well as helping to create a more responsible world. They have a zero net roadmap uh, created November 2021, very recent, in consultation with key stakeholders of the global industry. And, the, uh, and it highlights the current status quo and provides industry milestones for meaningful climate action and emissions reduction. As a few of us have commented, the pandemic uh, has made us see our own backyard differently. And we've certainly seen where uh, domestic tourism has always accounted for about 75% across Australasia. We're a long haul destination. And I can tell you the populace is just champing at the bit to travel again to those destinations they used to travel to. So is the WTTC net zero roadmap to be believed? How do we make individuals more conscious of their travel decisions in context to climate change and climate action? Have we learned nothing from the tragedy of the commons? As we know, the balance, uh, the, uh, in the balance between rich and resource, sorry, resource rich and resource poor countries is stark and the gap seems to be widening. We may talk of uh, protecting people and environments, yet we have seen with recent events in the Ukraine, and I felt quite conflicted about presenting on tourism when everything's going on over there at the moment, and we're once again under the threat of nuclear weapons. Decarbonizing must be more than a consumer choice. And while technology has some solutions, we must look at the very structure of our economies. Responsible tourism won't do it alone, and we need to reorientate rights and interests of local communities where we are more, quote, accountable to social and ecological limits. Uh, Higgins, uh, Desta Boys 2020, a very good article uh, that quote came from. So this is complex, wicked, 
social ecological problem across five le levels, the individual, the interpersonal, organizational community and global policy. Great areas for research. Um, I wanna to go to Inga Anderson to, uh, to finish, the executive director of the UNEP. The sector has less than 10 years to accelerate the transition to low carbon and circular business solutions to create new opportunities in energy generation, as just been said, and halve transport emissions by 2030, and to integrate nature-based solutions into their operations. If people have got papers in this area, I know Demetrius will be glad to take them and get them refereed. I'll finish there. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Huge, huge, huge challenge that becomes even more complicated right now with all the things that are happening. Okay. Uh, let's progress to the next SDG. Anna, welcome, Anna. Thank you. Sorry for being late. I had a class, uh, so I didn't uh, hear what was discussed in the first 30 minutes. Okay, we were saying how wonderful you <laughs> Okay, so I will start with the uh, first SDG, No Poverty. Um, just to uh, provide some background in terms of, of uh, poverty, um, poverty is basically um, measured by income in, in most countries and by most intergovernmental organizations. And there are two types of poverty that are uh, recognized. The first is extreme poverty, which is also known as absolute poverty. And of course, this refers to um, situations or countries where uh, population live on a very minimal uh, wage, they are not able to provide and cover their basic needs, whether that is have access to uh, clean water or food or shelter and so on. And relative poverty is basically uh, poverty levels that are measured in a country or in a region relative to others. And this is what we tend to use in the European Union. We tend to measure relative poverty of the uh, EU member states. Now, the interesting thing with poverty is that in terms of tourism, we have in our mind certain destinations that we regard as poor. However, we need to remember that poverty can also exist in affluent societies uh, and might be specific to specific um, regions, let's say, or, or a specific context, or even might be applicable for certain groups of the society, whether that is immigrants or seniors or women and so on. Uh, now, in terms of the post-pandemic era, what do we expect? Uh, we expect poverty levels to rise, not because COVID-19 has uh, created certain economic challenges for destinations, uh, especially countries that rely on tourism. I mean, this is um, understandable and expected. The other thing, though, that um, you know, the optimist probably didn't anticipate, I mean, we tend to think of <clears throat> the post-pandemic uh, era as, uh, you know, uh, this situation, which is very romantic and COVID is, is finished or it's normalized, so, you know, we go back to, to traveling. However, what we, what we didn't anticipate is that there are new types of crises that are emerging, such as the Ukrainian crisis and all the negative consequences um, economic consequences and social consequences that are uh, emerging. And this creates um, a complicated situation for tourism because in my view, there is desire to travel. And I think we all understood during COVID that we miss traveling. However, the economic situation will be such that most likely tourism expenditure will decline. So we need to uh, understand how tourism can contribute to poverty allevi alleviation in, in this kind of context of economic, let's say, uh, turbulence and social unrest. Um, so what we uh, can get from, from um, the literature related to poverty is that for um, certain destinations, to uh, improve the poverty levels through tourism. First of all, there needs to be an emphasis on regional tourism development. So the benefits from tourism development needs to be shared across a destination, uh, not just remain within, let's say, coastal uh, regions. And the other thing that is important is that tourism development has to be community-driven. 
I'm not using the term community-based because I think that's different, uh, but I emphasize community-driven tourism. So every community within a specific destination is to, to decide what type of tourism development they want, and they need to go um, about it on their own, which brings me to the next point, that there needs to be less dependence on tour operators. I think what we have learned in places like Cyprus and many other Mediterranean destinations is that what uh, COVID has taught us and what the um, crisis brought about by uh, the war in, in Ukraine has taught us is that we need to minimize dependence on foreign stakeholders. Uh, for a lot of destinations like, like Cyprus, we have a reliance on the Ukrainian Russian tourist market, which of course is uh, now gone. Um, so it's important for destinations, if they do not want the leakage of money, if they do not want to rely on these foreign stakeholders and um, deal with, with poverty issues, they need to um, basically um, ensure that tourism development comes from uh, within and is not reliant on external factors. Now, having said that, there are a lot of destinations, uh, particularly those that are perceived as destinations experiencing extreme poverty, that could benefit from the promotion of what we call prop, uh, poor tourism. And this is a type of tourism um, that relies heavily on volunteering, volunteer tourism. And we do see an increase in demand for this type of, of uh, tourism forms, um, which perhaps is something that certain destinations experiencing uh, extreme poverty might want to um, look into. But at the end of the day, uh, if we're going to look at tourism as an economic tool that can boost the economy of a destination that has high levels of poverty, then we need to be talking, of course, uh, about the empowerment of specific groups in the local community. What research shows us and what intergovernmental reports show is that there are specific groups in a society that have uh, more economic problems than others and uh, face uh, greater poverty. These tend to be um, single mothers, immigrants and retired people or people that we can regard as seniors. So true, if tourism is going to contribute to the reduction of, of, of poverty in destinations, then we need to place these vulnerable groups uh, in the center and try to see how um, tourism can empower uh, these, these groups. And uh, another option that we could consider is uh, poverty alleviation as a part of international corporations, uh, CSR. Now, we all know that um, the corporate social responsibility initiatives of, of many companies, international companies, are being driven by the desire to improve reputation and so on, in essence, marketing uh, incentives. Um, but if this is going to be the case, then they might just as well incorporate uh, specific programs that will contribute to the host community's uh, poverty reduction. Um, so, together with all the other um, great initiatives and programs that may uh, take place, uh, poverty alleviation needs to be at the centre. And by poverty alle alleviation, we don't necessarily mean charity or philanthropy. You, know, you can give a bread to someone or you can help someone to understand how they can source their own food. So, it is uh, this how, uh, how the host community uh, basically can um, Stand in its own feet, that is important um, and needs to be addressed by international corporations. Thank you very much. I think, I think this is one of the most important SDGs uh, because tourism is so critical uh, everywhere around the world. And, and you mentioned somewhere about tour operators and intermediaries, and it's, it's not only about what activity do we have, but actually what value it creates for the different stakeholders. And we need to understand how distribution operates. We need to understand what value is actually uh, arriving at the destination to the local people and those who own the resources. And, and this has always been the case, but now it's become much more critical and much more obvious because we can actually assess the situation in different places.
-hmm. Okay. Uh, you'd like to say something? I just wanted to mention that uh, we tend to uh, have this kind of like black and white view of tourism, you know, where, um, you know, tourism can contribute economically to, to a destination, even though it uh, yields several uh, social and environmental pressures. But I think the question here that we need to understand is, it's not about uh, tourism um, contributing economically to, to a society, a host community. It's about also what type of tourism development uh, is best um, in order to alleviate uh, poverty. And of course, this is context specific. Like I said, there are uh, destinations that are facing extreme poverty and there are others that are generally affluent societies and they just have specific regions that may have higher levels of, of poverty. But uh, tourism can be a great tool if it's developed and managed properly and responsibly. Exactly. And, and I think the other thing with poverty is that we, we tend to associate some regions and some countries with poverty. But um, the worst poverty I've ever seen is in the United States in some, some enclaves of very, very difficult situations and in England and some other places where you wouldn't expect that you find that, and I was expecting to one of our African students here that in in some countries that um, that they are poor countries, everybody is poor around them, and therefore people are sharing uh, cost suffering, but they don't have um, a different kind of wealth to compare with. While in some of the developing countries, you know, even Hong Kong. Uh, what you find is that the vast majority of the people are, are quite poor, 25%, one fourth of the population is before, be, below the poverty line. And equally, you find a very high level of the population that's very rich and they've got a lot of resources. So it's, it's, poverty is not uh, a matter of, uh, of location only, but it's really about distribution of wealth in, in societies. And then what do we do with tourism? And how does distribution of wealth uh, supports that strategic development goal? I think that's absolutely critical, and I'd love to see some papers on this. Just, uh, so just another. More... I was just going to make some... another co another comment on that, uh, particularly around um, uh, uh, single mothers were mentioned, but also in Australia, the largest growing group of homeless is women over fifty uh, who are separated uh, in their relationships. So we, we've got a, another underclass uh, over the 50 year old mark. So it's, uh, it's a very complex problem across the developed and the developing world. Thank you. And that's that we need to, we need to look into poverty in terms of where it's happening, which um, segments and what uh, parts of the society it's happening. And and to look into how tourism can actually alleviate poverty. And I have to say that in my travels, and before COVID I was traveling everywhere, I've seen so many places where tourism has actually contributed to that. And, and let's be honest, um, in some regions, tourism is the only um, viable economic activity, which is a bad thing on its own right, but actually that's a reality. So in some of the islands, some of the places, um, you find that the tourism is, is probably uh, the only activity that we can that we can do uh, uh, because the other activities would have never achieved a sustainably competitive advantage. So, and and a lot of I was really really concerned when a lot of people came out and they were talking about degrowth immediately. They start talking about degrowth when when COVID happened and. As you know, I've never I've never subscribed to over tourism because I don't think over tourism exists. It, it's really about managing uh, flows and managing uh, activities that are happening. But uh, so so poverty is is a critical thing that we need to address within the local context in different places, and and we must look into this. Gary, how many more slides or SDGs have we got? Because we don't have in order, so I don't know how. Many. Okay, we still have one, two, uh, three, four, five, probably five more. Okay, we're, we're doing good. Okay. 
So the next one is Anna as well, right? Yes, the next one though. Yeah. Hey. You seeing the board? Yes. All right. No, okay, so we're one. going to gender equality. Okay. Um, so so you had uh, well before. I had reduced yeah. inequalities before. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, is this? this? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, I mean, to be honest, I think that all of these uh, SDGs are kind of related. You know, I mean, we talk about reducing inequalities in a way, whether that is economic, social, or political inequalities that exist uh, between various groups. But these are related, of course, like poverty enhances these this inequalities. And at the end of the day, when we look at the tourism activity, we have the dominant society, which is, you know, the dominant group is the tourists. They have the power, they've got the money. And then they visit a host uh, community. And what we tend to see is like um, an illusion. You know, we've got two types of, of um, scenes. We've got the destination that the tourists see, the westernized resorts, um, you know, which looks great, great scenery. And then on the other hand, we have the real, let's say, destination, how the host community mm -hmm. lives. So it might present like two, two different realities in a way. Um, so what we need to be, what we need to understand is if we want to use tourism uh, to reduce inequalities, we need to understand the sources of inequalities. And there are different types of inequalities. There are economic, social, political, mm -hmm. a lot of these are interlinked. And we see inequalities even in the most affluent societies, even in the most affluent destinations, there are inequalities that are persistent and again, there are certain groups in the society that tend to experience these inequalities more than others, whether that is because of religion or ethnicity or gender or age. Uh, so, of course, to understand how tourism can reduce inequalities in a society, we need to look at the sources. Um, a good starting point, of course, is to emphasize the development of sustainable tourism. Um, in order to ensure that there is an equitable distribution, not just of benefits, but of resources. So this is an important one because um, in terms of, you know, uh, empower, empowering specific groups in the society, well, in order to do this, they need to have the resources. So uh, tourism development should focus not just on distributing economic benefits, but also economic resources. And if uh, we're going to emphasize community-driven tourism, then we need um, to see the development of perhaps small-scale small alternative tourism forms that will, by extent, reduce the reliance on foreign stakeholders such as tour operators. Um, the other thing that we need to remember in all of this is that tourism can be used as a political tool it can be, of course, used to improve the economy uh, of, of a destination, but it can also either um, bring different groups together. At the same time, it can deepen the social gap between people. So we do have instances where tourism has proven to improve human relations and understanding among uh, people in some cases even alleviate animosity and promote social justice. And there are different types of tourism forms that help to do this. Um, so it's not all tourism that is good or all tourism that is bad. But again, we have to go back and um, be selective in terms of what type of tourism we, um, we choose to develop. Um, but I think also when we talk of reduced inequalities, we need to look at governance structures. And a bottom-up approach, of course, has been preferred in many destinations. It has been acknowledged as a sustainable development, let's say, uh, requirement. But um, the key aspect, the key problem, the key challenge with uh, tourist governance is the marginalization of certain groups, especially the local community. So if we we want to reduce inequalities, we need to promote inclusivity. Inclusivity in terms of tourism decision-making and tourism development. 
And um, of course, uh, something which is related to sustainable development, responsible tourism to promote ec ecological justice and balance of power between the two predominant groups, the tourists and the um, host community. Um, and the difference with responsible tourism is that uh, the tourists, you know, the consumers need to be held accountable for their actions, for their activities. Um, and this is important, especially in destinations that experience poverty, or we have these two different, let's say, types of realities, you know, how people locally live. They might live on, on uh, very bad uh, conditions and then where the tourist holiday. So it's important that the tourist doesn't remain in a resort, a luxury resort, but actually see, um, you know, get, get a more authentic tourist experience and see how the local community lives and how he or she can contribute to the improvement of, of the conditions of um, uh, the life and, and the well-being of the of the host community. Thank you very much, Anna. And, and a lot of people are asking me um, whether they can combine SDGs on their papers. And of course, you know, reducing inequality and income and poverty are very much interrelated. So yes, um, you, you can uh, you can link the different SDGs. And, and make sure that your research is addressing those things. Uh, thank you very much. And the next, uh, the next uh, slide, Gary. Uh, that is also similar in a, in a way, and Anna is addressing this gender equality. Yes, gender equality. Again, um, like I said, you know, a lot of these SDGs are, are related, uh, depending on the context, of course. Um, now. Gender inequality, e even today, despite all these uh, wonderful movements and, and initiatives and the legislation that have, has been passed on, unfortunately, gender in inequality is still persistent uh, in all, all societies, uh, in developing destinations, in developed um, destinations, Western societies, and so on. So um, we have a lot of um, examples of women that face economic, political, and social discrimination, uh, whether they're working in the industry uh, or whether they're participating in, in local, or regional, or national uh, politics. And of course, uh, socially, there is a lot of discrimination. And I think what COVID has highlighted is uh, how difficult it is for women to also balance uh, the professional responsibilities with home responsibilities. Um, so in the post-COVID, um, the post-pandemic era, I think that it would be wonderful to see research on how different aspects of tourism can promote gender um, equality, whether that has to do with employees, female employees in the industry, or policymakers, or even uh, female tourists. So uh, certain issues that can be uh, considered and addressed is how we can improve the employment of women, how we can ensure that more women are uh, recruited in the uh, global tourism industry. For this to happen, it's important for educational programs targeted to women to be offered. Um, of course, equal salaries and career progression opportunities uh, are required because this is something that we see even in um, affluent societies. We see less female managers, we see discrepancies in terms of salaries between uh, men and women if they do the same uh, job. Um, we also need to make sure that there are resources provided to women who wish to pursue entrepreneurial initiatives. And tourism has proven to be a great industry for women, particularly in certain parts of the world, so that they can actually get some income. And there are initiatives such as the, the Airbnb platform, for instance, it has proven amazing for women um, you know, to care for others and open their house, basically, and provide hospitality whilst making an income. So the resources need to be provided to allow women to be creative and innovative in, in their own uh, respect. 
Um, another important aspect that we don't tend to see a lot in terms of research, I believe, is how women can be included uh, in tourism decision making. So there is a lot about a, a lot of studies on women and uh, working in the industry or uh, female uh, managers but not so much on policy making and how women's involvement in this can actually influence the direction of tourism development and governance. Um, and like I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, what COVID has taught us is that we need to be flexible in terms of work-life balance. Uh, and I think this has been more evident uh, by, uh, by women um, in certain parts of the world. Uh, so what might be necessary in the post-pandemic era is to improve the flexibility in terms of working, um, especially for, for women. And the other thing that we have to acknowledge, of course, is that women uh, uh, travelers, uh, they are an important uh, part of the tourism uh, industry. There are a lot of um, solo female travelers and they get a sense of empowerment uh, from traveling. So it is worth to pursue uh, research on this uh, group also and on this aspect because um, this sense of empowerment contributes to uh, gender equality. Thank you very much, Anna. We, we see actually uh, most of tourism is dominated by women. We see women in all layers and actually we, we see that women take the vast majority of the jobs in, in, in tourism and hospitality, but that's not reflected on the higher, uh, uh, on the hierarchy, on the higher uh, end of that. And, and we really need to look into uh, all the issues that, that you mentioned. Thank you very much. Any, uh, any points, any questions? Okay, let's go to the next one. Then we're going to have a, an open question uh, for probably. CC, you've been quiet there in the corner. It's three o'clock or what? Uh, yeah, it's it's right now four a.m. So I'm getting awake now. <laughs> Thank you. Hello everyone, this is Cici Lan. Uh, I'm happy to be here today to talk about how tourism help SDGs. Um, so it's early in the morning for me, but uh, had good afternoon or good evening based on which, which time zone you are in. I'm gonna go over two SDGs here quickly, hopefully, because everybody's gonna be, as everybody's tired now at this moment or after one and a half an hour. So first of all, STG 9 um, encompasses three important aspects of sustainable development, um, infrastructure, industrialization, and innovation. It aims to build resilient infrastructure, promote sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation. During COVID-19, we have witnessed its um, devastating impacts on global manufacturing pr production and transportation infrastructure, which calls for help from the tourism industry. So first of all, tourism development relies on good public and private infrastructure. The tourism industry can influence public policy for infrastructure update and renovation to attract tourists. In addition, tourism companies are willing to invest in sustainable facility and infrastructure that allow universal access and use, especially by persons with disabilities and other disabled groups. So accessible transportation would be a great topic to in, uh, research in the future. Second, the new facil facility and infrastructure development has been moved toward more sustainable, innovative, and resource efficient. And the tourism industry has been focusing on decreasing carbon footprint caused by transportation, especially air travel, which actually overlaps SDG 13 climate action that um, Professor Darcy just covered. As my colleagues introduced early in SDG 11 and 12, 
technology has been a buzzy word these days. The tourism industry is also a trailblazer in adopting information and communication technologies. The changing traveler needs, especially during the pandemic, further accelerate, accelerate this rapid adoption of technologies. Emerging technologies that revolutionizing future travel include Internet of Things, mobile technology, virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality, artificial intelligence, AI, um, ver a voice assistant and robotics, big data, blockchains, and biometrics, an umbrella term to embrace all these emerging information and communication technologies in tourism is smart tourism, referring to the application of technology for developing innovative tools in tourism. It supports destinations to find innovative ways to collect and use data derived from different sources to enhance tourism experience, improve the efficiency of resource management, maximize destination competitiveness with an emphasis on sustainable aspects. All these present endless opportunities for our future tourism research. And Professor Buhalis, I know you are an expert in this area, so please feel free to jump in. Thank you so much. I think you've covered the whole range of things, and I think it's all about it's all about value co-creation by bringing different players to use technology and innovations in, a, in the smart info, infrastructure and ecosystems to, 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 br to bring all the value that is being shared between different people. So it, it's, it, it's really critical to look into how can we use technology and it's not about technology, it's about how do we use technology in a smart way to bring benefits to everybody who is in the in in, in the ecosystem? And I, and I think that is a very topical kind of area that that we need to address. Thank you, okay, Gary. Next, next slide, So next, SDG 17 aims to strengthen the means of implication, sorry, implementation and revitalizing the global partnership for sustainable development. It is a call for countries to align policies for cross-sector and cross-country collaboration in pursuit of all the sustainable goals. So how can tourism help to achieve SDG 17? First of all, due to its cross-sectional nature, tourism has the ability to strengthen private public partnerships and engage multiple stakeholders, international, national, regional, and local, to work together to achieve the SDGs and other common goals. Co cooperation between tourism companies local communi communities, governments, and educational institutions is essential to achieve effective sustainable tourism. The private-public partnerships also create dialogue, dialogues between different stakeholders for knowledge sharing and multiplier impacts. Next, I'm, I want to bring your attention to Russia's recent invasion of Ukraine that actually brings this term solidarity tourism to our attention. According to UNWTO Secretary General, tourism is a genuine driver of solidarity and development. It has the power to bring people and community together. The current world situation drives us to think deeply on what the tourism industry can do to develop cross-country collaborations to help people during crisis. In the past decade, thanks to the economic, social, and technological changes, the sharing economy has grown into a multi-billion dollar industry and brought serious challenges to the tourism industry, especially 
disturbing market competitions and policy making. However, the sharing economy is also known for its re reduction in net consumption and improvement in material efficiency. Thus has huge potential for sustainability. In order to fully realize the sustainable benefits of the sharing economy, destinations should encourage the cooperation of all the participants in the sharing ecosystems, including regulators, platform owners and managers, peer suppliers, consumers, and traditional company competitors. Last but not least, destination governance is the cornerstone, the cornerstone for the success of destinations to achieve sustainable development. It takes a holistic perspective on the coordination of collective action in destinations, in which decisions are the results of interaction between public and private stakeholders. Destination governance is being a consolidated system to create and implement inclusive management processes. DMOs should encourage multi-stakeholder initiatives to be involved in destination decision-making and contribute to sustainable development. The complex nature and fast changing context of destination governance make it a promising future research direction in our field. That's it for this SDG 17. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the last uh, SDG out of the 17 ones. And in that sense, it brings everything together with partnerships. Partnerships in, in tourism is nothing new. Uh, because we've always had to have partnerships in order to be able to deliver tools. And I think this is really important in really understanding how to engage the different players together and in, in order to address the different needs and, and bring the value to everybody. We are used to that in tourism, but I think we really need to crystallize how the ecosystems can work together. And the very last one, I think they've, uh, I think uh, Sisi uh, kept for me right at the end, which is about quality education. And I think it's really important to see how we in universities and how education can actually contribute to all of those things above the other 16 SDGs. And how can we develop uh, tourism education curriculums and research that will address, will enable us to address all these challenges. I think a lot of people need to start realizing that by 2030, probably one third of the jobs that we are going to have in tourism and hospitality have not been invented yet. And I think we really need to start being very, very brave and start looking to how can we use innovation to address the challenges? I don't know of anybody who really wants to be a, a, hot, a, 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 a dishwasher. And worse than that, I don't know of anybody who'd like to be a pot washer. What do we do in research and what do we innovation do we bring together to actually make uh, decent work and a work that is actually uh, is, is uh, supporting good quality of living. And I think this is what education should be about. Education uh, in tourism should not only be about skills and what do we do tomorrow, but we should train our students to think how they can make destinations and how they can make the tourism industry a much better place to work to enjoy life and how can this activity contribute to uh, to society, to sustainability, to economies, to small business, to gender, to anybody who is marginalized. So I think I think we really need to see some innovations in quality of education and how those have got to be translated into tourism and how we can take these things forward.
And I think that is uh, probably the last slide we've got with SDGs, right? I think the next slide is any questions, questions and answers. I know that in the beginning I've said that we're going to discuss every single SDG as we're going ahead. But then I was look, I was looking at my watch and I was really afraid that we are going to run out of time. So I've answered all the questions on 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 the chat uh, where people were asking questions. But that's an opportunity actually to take uh, to spend five minutes uh, to either discuss on the panel or to have any additional questions that people may have. So let's open five minutes of questions, either and or discussion in the panel based on what we have heard. And I like also to give uh, one minute to each uh, of our colleagues on the panel to uh, to suggest what they would like to to see published in tourism review in the agenda 2030. Let's start from Gary because he hasn't spoken at all. So let's see. Um, what would you like, Gary, uh, to see on the Agenda 2013 Tourism Review? Well, if you personally ask me, uh, I would like to see more uh, technology. Yeah, how technology is, you know, helping to uh, create uh, value co-creation, uh, helping sustainability, yeah, in terms of communities and so on. So that's something that I would like to see more. Because technology is an enabler and technology will support us to address a lot of those challenges. Um, and, and we should be not only looking to how technology is uh, enabling us to do things, but we should be looking to how technology can take away the hard work, bring more benefits to communities, reduce the, um, the, the damaging in, uh, act to the, to the environment. And also helping us to to have a better tourism activity. Um, you know, I'm I'm going around in in, uh, in in Hong Kong, and obviously I do not speak Cantonese, but I'm using uh, Google Translate to actually speak to the my smartphone and then translate it to the local people or to read menus uh, and to kind of engage in conversation. So. So what we'll see is, is a whole range of technological activities coming forward and, and, and capabilities that will support us um, doing a lot of these things. Um, on the gender thing, uh, I was advising one of my colleagues and good friends back in England who was um, looking after three kids. And when I spoke to her, she said, um, I used to work as a revenue manager, but now I cannot because I'm working uh, I'm, I'm raising my kids, and I said, "Okay, if you if you really want to go back to work, there's a possibility to actually telework because now we are becoming digital modern, nomads and work around the times that you will have available. And revenue management is one of these things that that can give you you don't need face to face meeting with with customers, so it gives you a little bit of flexibility in in what time you're doing." So there'll be a lot of technological develop, developments coming forward. So who would like to uh, bring some concluding remarks, Simon? Yeah, I opened up the mic. Uh, I'd like to come back to the innovation space and the infrastructure space. There's no doubt that in uh, in one area of quality and around disability, the, the area I do most of my work in, that Technology can help with some things, but a global commitment to accessible infrastructure, particularly transport infrastructure, is the biggest problem facing people with mobility disability. There's some, uh, there's some uh, good uh, examples of universal design principles, but I did send an email to uh, Elon Musk suggesting that it'd be fantastic to have a production line uh, wheelchair accessible electric vehicle coming off to stop all the inefficiency of re-engineering work. So in, in that space, I'd really love to see some breakthroughs so that people do have the opportunity to dream to go where they wish to go and use all the wonderful technology that's being developed to making it easier. Thank you very much. Uh, technology for inclusion, basically. Um, for disability and all kinds of other in inclusion. 
I mean, one of the one of the areas of disability uh, that that a lot of people have got is languages. So um, we really need to 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 use technology uh, more holistically to to address different exclusion things. If, uh, if, anyone, if, any, if anyone remembers Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, they had the Babel fish that went into your ear and translated all languages. Uh, to you directly, uh, I think that would be a, a, a magnificent breakthrough. I got it here, mate. It's working for me here as we speak. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Anna. Yes. Your concluding remarks. What you what you like to see published in Tourism Review in the Agenda 2030. That probably has to do with what uh, I find interesting in terms of research. Um, I think there needs to be a shift on the social aspect of tourism, such as the one discussed, you know, whether that is the reduction of poverty or reduction of um, inequalities, um, and particularly focus on certain uh, groups whether that is employees or members of the local community or tourists such as women let's say or seniors i think there is a scope for further research on of this type of of topics thank you very much and i think one of the what, what was coming to my mind is that we really need to see tourism for peace uh that you have done work on this in the past but I think we really need to see uh, tourism for peace, in particular, uh, in in this context that we're we're going through now. Daisy. Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, I think I had a very similar feeling with Anna, since we are dealing with the social aspect of tourism. So I think I probably uh, want to see more for the social sensibility, and that's very inclusive a lot of uh, themes coming into that. But I had a feeling that uh, so far, we have a very narrow um, understanding about social sensibility in tourism. And sometimes we don't really realize it's part of it. So I think we should have a more uh, a broader view about the social sensibility and uh, become more inclusive in this topic. Yeah. Thank you so much. Dr. Chen. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, actually, I would like to call for more research on entrepreneurship, on entrepreneurs, uh, because they are the decision makers, and they are the uh, they are the one who decides to continue or to stop. Actually, uh, according to your research in Dijiang, uh, ancient time in Yunnan province, uh, uh, we interviewed many of the uh, uh, top managers, the the funders. I mean, they are uh, they have been suffering from the uh, pandemic, the mental health problems. So many of them decided, that, okay, I will just stop. So uh, when they stop operation, uh, be, a lot of people would go uh, unemployed. So um, uh, yes, we we actually we are seeing a great number of research uh, in this area, uh, but still uh, we don't have enough. Uh, uh, probably because they are not very easy to approach because uh, they are the top managers so they are not very they are not as easy as those tourists or uh, ordinary employees to be uh, studied but we still need to try to focus uh focus on them yes they should be uh focused they should be uh, we should pay attention to them so that's it thank you <clears throat> thank you thank you very much last uh word to dr uh long Hi, thank you. So uh, my actually my research area was in technology and I'm happy to see so many panelists already mentioned technology and uh, for me personally, I've seen so many technology studies but with consumers, not with employees. So I would think maybe in the future I want to see more like people looking at how technology can help employees like helping them to um, reduce their stress, to um, to help with their uh, well-being, mental health, 
And also like in the US, I'm not sure in other countries, but in the US, the hospitality industry, tourism industry is facing a severe labor shortage. So how like technologies can attract, help to attract more employees to our industry will be very important. And this kind of research will definitely help the industry a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see Fei Fei coming back. Hello. So last word, Fei Fei. Hi, thank you. Um, I think the SDG we talked about today, the 17 goals, and as Anna mentioned earlier, I think a lot of them are related to each other. So I think when we're writing papers, we are perhaps not particularly targeting one particular SDG, but we probably are talking about possible uh, SDGs in, in general. I think in terms of uh, the topic I mentioned today, in terms of the consumption one, I think um, currently uh, there are a lot of papers talking about tourists, so I think if you are targeting um, from a different angle, perhaps from a um, community, perhaps from biz a business or industry point of view, that would be a good starting point of um, innovative perspectives. I think also um, maybe taking a new or relatively um, innovative method um, instead of uh, using traditional survey, instead of using a different uh, traditional methods, maybe using a more innovative, like um, using big data and this sort of thing, uh, you know, trying to uh, bring something new into your paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Um, can you go to the next slide, uh, Gary? And I just will say, please submit your paper. I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank Emerald in Asia for uh, helping us with all that. I'd like to ask everybody uh, who attended. We had more than 250 people who uh, participated today and the questions that we had. I really like to thank all the panelists for their contribution. And particularly, I'd like to thank CC for helping out with the presentation and bring everything up to, uh, together and waking up at two o'clock in the morning to be with us. Thank you and Gary for all the technical support and his patience uh, when I didn't like uh, the system. I look forward to receiving your papers and I look forward to the tourism review contribution to the agenda 2030 and to make our world a better world, a healthier world, a, a, a world that, a, a world that um, is peaceful and a world that is actually contributing to community all around the world. Thank you very much. We're just over two minutes, Rosita, but we're just on time. Okay. Thank you very much. Do I just say goodbyes? And I'll say good yes, morning, so. good evening, yeah. good afternoon, <laughs> and. Uh, I'm looking forward to receiving your papers. Thank you. Bye bye. See you. Bye bye. bye. See you. See you. Bye. Thank okay. You bye. We will bye. Upload, bye everyone. We will also upload this uh, uh, seminar so other people can watch it if they then have the opportunity to do already. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.